Good morning, grade elevens. I hope you are enjoying the studying at home and that things are not being a little bit too difficult for you. So what we've decided to do is we are taking the PowerPoint that we gave you and we're just going to add in a little bit more information and doing this video just so you can have, you know, sort of a, a verbal instruction to show you this section of joints. So please use this video, please pause, rewind, make notes, you know, use your textbook as a sort of a guide long to go through it. And if you do have any questions, just either send us a message on Teams, I'll put my Sky panel in the YouTube, also consult the additional video that I'm going to put a link to below, which really gives you a nice sort of another visual representation of this thing that we're talking about, which is joints. So let's get going. When I talk about joints, what is a joint? So the way that we would describe a joint is any point in the skeleton where two or more bones meet. So at any time you're going to have two bones that are next to each other in your skeleton, we would refer to that as a joint. Now there are lots and lots and lots of joints that are in your body. I mean, if you think about your hand alone, where every single bone is beating with each other, there are joints that are occurring between those. So they are very important to us because what is their purpose? Their purpose is to provide us with structure and mobility. So the structure comes from the way that the joints are orientated, essentially gives us as humans the shape that we are, um, it provides us the protection that we need, the way that they are orientated, and the mobility comes from the fact that, well, we need a skeleton in order to move. If we had no skeleton, we would just be a lump of flesh that would be sitting, you know, lying on the floor somewhere. So the mobility comes from the way that the joints are orientated to provide us with the different types of movements that we require. So how is this structure and mobility maintained? Because, you know, bones just kind of sitting next to each other doesn't really mean anything. We need to have some way of them being held together, them being directed. The bones themselves don't actually move. Something else causes them to move. So what we need to then remember is when we talk joints, we are talking tendons and ligaments being involved as well. So if you remember, we discussed tendons and ligaments last year when we did uh, mammalian tissue and we did the difference between them but now it's really going to start to become more applied so you get to see how they're actually working together so here's a little picture to show you the difference between the tendons and the ligaments so on the left hand side I've got the tendons linking with the bone and the muscle so the muscle is being attached to the bone through the use of a tendon. So in the picture on the left-hand side, you can see that the red bit is the muscle. There's the bone that's there, but all these white parts here, those are tendons. So the tendon in this picture is essentially doing several functions, really. So number one, as I said, the tendon, it physically connects the muscle to the bone. Because the bone itself is not going to be able to move. The muscle is the force generating tissue or unit of our body. Without the muscle, we would not be able to move. We would not be able to generate the force needed to do whatever movement is required. So what you can see is down here at the bottom, this particular part of the tendon is going to cause the bottom half of this forearm, because this is the elbow, to actually move. So the force that is being generated in the muscle is being transferred through this tendon. So the force is generated here, and then it moves through this tendon to be able to allow this bone to move. So that's what causes the locomotion to occur. But at the same time, what the tendon is doing at this side is it is allowing stability to be created within the particular joint. So although this is the joint that is occurring here, there's also a joint that's happening at your shoulder, up at the top here just off screen, these tendons are providing the stability as well as allowing for us to have motion to occur. So that is tendons. Then on the right-hand side, we have ligaments. So all the white parts within this hand structure between the wrist and the fingers, all of those ones, those are ligaments. So the ligament then is actually physically holding the bones together because as much as they can be next to each other, something needs to physically hold them together, which is the ligament. So as much as the tendon is transferring the force, 
and creating stability, the ligament is also physically holding these bones together and providing the stability of the whole joint in itself. So you don't see, there's no muscles in this picture at the moment. There are muscles, but you don't see them because this is just showing you the ligaments. So what the ligament also does is it limits the way that the two bone, two or more bones are able to move based on their orientation. So they are going to guide the way that the force is going to be transferred. So in a way, it's dictating the way that the movement can occur. So this is both from a safety perspective and from a functional perspective. Because if all your joints were just able to move in all different directions, we wouldn't be able to have any control. We wouldn't be able to be more specific in what our motion is. So we did discuss a little bit last year that the fact that these are both connective tissues, but the main difference in terms of their components that make them up is that your tendons have no elastic fibers in them, but your ligaments do have elastic fibers. So just make sure that you remember that if we're talking about a structural difference between them, so there's lots of mainly collagen that you'll find in your tendon, your ligament will have both collagen and elastin fibers to provide it that slight elasticity that it needs. Okay, so much like when we talked about bone, we discussed the structure of bone, etc., we could then classify types of bone, such as long, short, irregular, and flat. We can also create categories or classifications of joints, so the different types of joints that exist in your body. So there are three main types of joints that exist in your body, and that is fibrous, cartilaginous, and synovial. So generically, these are the three main categories of joints that you will find in your body. So fibrous joints are known as immovable joints. So where these two or more bones are meeting, there is actually no movement between them. And I know it kind of sounds a bit counterintuitive, like, but surely you want a joint, we want movement to occur. No, there are certain places in our body where we don't want any movement to occur. So, for example, if we look at your skull, your cranium, your cranium is not just one bone. There are several bones that are actually connected to each other. And if we had lots of movement that was occurring between these bones, it would not be doing what those bones are supposed to be doing then. They are supposed to be providing protection for your brain. So we need a nice solid structure to be occurring here to provide that protection. So in between each of those different bones, we have something called a suture. That's just this particular joint between the cranial bones. So there is no movement that is occurring between these bones. So that is why that joint where those two or more bones meet is immovable. We don't want movement there. Another example is down at the bottom where your tibia and your fibula meet down at the bottom by your ankle. There is a joint that occurs here where this is a fibrous joint. We don't want any movement to be occurring here because then it wouldn't provide the stability that we need at the ankle particularly. There's also a little bit of a joint that also occurs at the top from there, but that is fibrous joints. Then we get to cartilaginous joints. So a cartilaginous joint is a partially movable joint. So there's a small range of motion that occurs. So examples of this exist between your ribs and your sternum. So it might not seem that there is movement occurring, but remember you are breathing in and out. You need your rib cage to be able to expand and contract. If there was no movement that could occur between that, say for example, if the ribs were directly exactly fused with the sternum, you wouldn't be able to inflate your lungs that much. You wouldn't be able to get as much air in. So there needs to be a small amount of movement that is occurring to allow that flexibility between the ribs. Another example is in your intervertebral discs in your spine. So, yes, you may be able to bend all the way over to one side or bend forward and, you know, sort of move around, but that is the result of small individual movements from each vertebra combining together to cause that overall movement. So, overall, the, the movement of the vertebral column or individual vertebra is actually very small. And again, we don't want to have lots of movement occurring in our spine because what is it doing? It's protecting our spinal column. We need that to be protected very well. 
but we still need to have a little bit of range of motion. So the range is given there. Another example is the pubic symphysis. So the join in the front between the two pelvic bones, there is a slight range of motion that can occur within that pubic symphysis. So that is cartilaginous joints. Then we get synovial joints. So synovial joints are freely movable. They are described as freely movable joints in that there is a large range of motion that is occurring with them. Now synovial joints, there are many, many synovial joints in your body. And because there are lots of them, we like to categorize them. But this is an example of a generic synovial joint. So although there is not a specific join between the two of them, we have something called an articular capsule. There's a capsule filled with fluid that exists between these two bones. Because these bones are moving, we need to have some sort of sufficient lubrication between them in order for this to occur. So this is another image showing you a typical synovial joint. So this image here you are going to have to know how to do a biological drawing of this image. So again, ignore these kind of little holes and things in the bone between here. It's just the generic structure. So yes, you need to know all the labels relating to articular or hyaline cartilage, synovial membrane, the articular capsule, and that there is synovial flu fluid within this joint cavity. You then you also need to know the functions of each of these things. Remember, articular cartilage, cartilage at the ends of the bones, what is that for? Well, it's allow for smooth movement uh, to occur, reduced friction, and very minor shock absorption, but mainly it's the smooth movement to occur. The articular capsule is basically the ligaments surrounding the outside. So the ligaments enclose this capsule and provide and will prevent it from dislocating, essentially. The synovial membrane, the membrane on the inside, the function is to produce synovial fluid. This fluid that is inside the joint. So synovial fluid has several functions. So much like how we have the articular cartilage that reduces friction, the synovial fluid really helps to act as a lubricant and to help reduce that main sort of bone on bone rubbing that occurs. It also does help in terms that it is liquid. It does some shock absorption. So it allows us to absorb some of the shock when we have these movements that are occurring. And at the same time, it also nourishes the cartilage. Because remember, cartilage doesn't have much blood flow that's going to it. So in order for this to keep the nutrients and for it to be alive and well, we have our synovial fluid that does this. So remember, this image you need to know as a biological drawing. But again, this is a typical, like, synovial joint that we have, like a generic synovial joint. We obviously have more specific forms of the synovial joint. And as I said, we like to categorize things. So there are four main categories of synovial joint that we want you to understand. There are two additional ones, the saddle and the ellipsoid, but you don't need to worry about those. We're only focusing on these four over here, ball and socket, hinge, pivot, and plane. But before I move on to what each of these are, I want you to notice that I've got now two different categories of things that I've talked about. The first one was where I talked about categories of joints, fibrous, cartilaginous, synovial. And then I said that there was categories of synovial joint, ball and socket, hinge, pivot, and plane. So be careful when you get asked a question. If I ask you, what is the category of this joint in a picture or something that I've talked about, I'm referring to one of these three, fibrous, cartilaginous, synovial. If I ask you, what is this category of synovial joint, we are then looking at the subsection of synovial. So you cannot tell me if I say, what is the category of X? or category of joint for this picture, you can't tell me it's ball and socket. It's one of these three. And if I say to you, what is the category of this synovial joint? You can't tell me synovial because I've already asked you though, I've said that it's a synovial one. So make sure you, if you get a question on that, that you make sure you're giving the correct category. Is it of the joint or is it of the synovial joint? Okay. So let's get into it. Ball and socket joint. So there are two ball and socket joints in your body, and that is the uh, where the femur goes into the pelvis, 
and where the shoulder meets the scapula. And basically, as the name suggests, it is a ball, ball head, going into a socket, a bony socket. Really, that's what it is. How do we characterize the movement of a ball and socket joint? Well, there's most movements can be done. Forward, backward, side, in, rotational movements. A lot of all of that can be done with a ball and socket joint. Again, by yourself, lift your arm up. Try and move your arm in many different directions. Front, back, outward, inward, round in a circle. It can do all of those. So that is ball and socket. Then we get a hinge joint. So the way that I want you to think about a hinge joint is I want you to think about a door, like a normal door. When you open a door and close a door, it can only move in one direction. It can only open on the hinge and close on the hinge. So these are examples are the same in your body. They can only move in one direction. So if you think about your elbow, stick your arm out straight in front of you. How does your forearm move? It moves just up and down. There's no sideways motion. There's no rotational from the actual elbow elbow itself. That's really what is a hinge joint. The other example is at your knee. Is there a way that your knee can really move side to side at the knee? No, not really. That's it. The only movement it can do is flexing and extending. So those are your hinge joints. Now, there are some of you who are saying, oh, but if I, I can turn my forearm, I can rotate it round. Well, remember, you're not actually doing that from your elbow. But what you are doing is you are using a different kind of pivot joint. So a pivot is a rotational joint. The most easiest example to know is at your first two vertebrae, your atlas and your axis. Remember, the axis, the one on the bottom, is what allows you to do the rotational movement of your head. So moving side to side, that is where between these two bones, they are rotating around each other. Now, talking about the elbow example, that is where there is a rotational one between your radius and your ulna. So to illustrate this, on your table in front of you, or get to a table, put your forearm flat on the surface with your palm facing upwards. So your palm's facing up, the forearm is flat where it is there. Now turn your hand over so that your palm is facing down. Did your elbow actually move? Did the elbow rotate to do that? No. What happened was the ulna and the radius rotated around each other. So that occurs at this rotation point here. So not the elbow itself, but just this rolling over this one. So that is a pivot joint. And then the last one is a plane joint. So essentially what happens with a plane joint is it's like a sliding motion. So although they don't do any other funky movements, it's like it will just slide on top of each other. And that, an example, is what you'll find in your carpals and your tarsals in your foot. So that's really all that a plane joint is, is that there's a sliding motion. One more little extra thing to add is this thing called a bursa. So it's not quite in your textbook, but it's a good thing to understand. A bursa is basically a fat pad. It's like an area of fat that helps to protect certain areas of your body where there's either high ranges of movement or where there's bone that's maybe exposed a lot. So, for example, underneath your elbow, there is a little bursa that occurs because there's no real protection at the bottom of your elbow because of the small flap of skin that's there. Just underneath your shoulder, in between your shoulder, because there's lots of spaces, you have lots of rubbing that occurs between this tendon and this muscle based on the bone. So having the bursa there reduces the amount of friction that occurs. It is possible to have an inflammation of a bursa, and we refer to that as bursitis. So itis being any inflammation thing. So here's an example of an inflamed elbow bursitis. But the bursa, a fat pad that allows to reduce the friction that is occurring. So that really brings us to the end of joints for what they are and the categories of joints. We'll do another section where we talk about the injuries of joints, because now that we understand the normal functioning, we'll be able to go and understand the injuries. So please go back, make sure you pause, rewind, watch again, understand the difference between the tendons and ligaments what's important between the tendon and ligament, 
the classifications of joints. How would you describe a fibrous, cartilaginous, and synovial joint? Then the different categories of synovial joint themselves, plus examples. So you're wanting ball and socket, hinge, pivot, and plane. And then just add this little information that you've got on the bursa. So make sure that you have made copious notes on that and that you have an understanding. You can give examples and explanations of all of them. Make sure you do your learning activity exercises to go through each of them. If you do have any questions, you can either send us a message on Teams to say that you want a little bit of a clarification. We can set up a meeting on Skype or meeting from there. Um, I'll put my Skype handle in from there. Um, otherwise, you can email us and we'll be able to help you with anything with regards to that. Hope you're enjoying the studying and I hope this video helps you guys.